Hey everyone, and welcome to the Building Geniuses podcast, where we talk to geniuses throughout the commercial real estate and building automation industries, asking them how they've gotten where they are, who's walked alongside them, and how they're bringing others alongside them along the way. Today is episode 12, and our final episode of season one, and I am your host, Tim Vogel. Today, we are speaking with Lucian Niemeyer of buildingcybersecurity.org. Lucian, welcome to the Building Geniuses podcast. Hey, Tim, it's a thrill to be on, on board with you, particularly on the 12th and final uh, uh, episode this season for your first season. I, I congratulate you on a fantastic run so far. I'm uh, hoping that uh, we'll be able to leave your listeners with uh, something to look forward to in season two. Um, but uh, by the way, I do realize that uh, a building genius uh, is kind of ca- counterintuitive that he'd be wearing a 1995 headset. Um, but it, it does allow me to be able to uh, talk to you more clearly. Um, and I do have a side gig um, that might come up from time to time and do an air traffic control at DCA here in Washington, D.C. So um, yeah. so if you hear me cut out to do some uh, vectoring, yeah, you know what it is. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's a thrill, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Well, Lucian, it's so great to have you, and I absolutely want to hear more about uh, your air traffic control uh, ways and, and abilities. Um, so tell us and the uh, – oh, I also wanted to say this. Uh, thank you to you. you you had mentioned you are the twelfth disciple, so that's good. Yeah, that's that's how I, I I'll remember you. The twelfth. I did. Disciple. I did not say that. I was. <laughs> I would never equate equate myself with uh, one one of the twelve chosen. But uh, yes, it's it's great to be on your final episode. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what you spend a lot of your time doing these days, particularly around building cybersecurity. Yeah, it, it's a passion for me, and uh, it it's been an amazing uh, journey. Uh, since leaving federal government. I, I've spent most of my career in public service as an Air Force vet. Um, I started really looking at cybersecurity when I was on the uh, working for the United States Senate on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And we really started to take a look at it from a national security perspective. Um, that passion also led me into the Department of Defense where I served as an Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, uh, for the largest real estate portfolio in the world. And, and I had a direct order uh, from then Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis um, that in a connected society, uh, we were more vulnerable um, to potential attack. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the 2018 National Defense Strategy put out by the uh, uh, administration, it does talk about the fact that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. And in, in a connected society, we anticipate we may see attacks to our grid, to our water systems, um, and to other critical infrastructure um, if, in, when we, if we get into a uh, competition or a conflict with a near-peer competitor. So uh, Secretary Mass made it very clear to me uh, when I got into the job, um, it was my responsibility to fix it, to come up with a solution, uh, not just admire the problem. And, and since then, I've been committed to uh, working with um, a whole range of industry stakeholders, um, both from the uh, control side to how it's applied. Um, and that is ultimately how the nonprofit Building a Cybersecurity came about. Uh, along with some mentors I'll talk about here in a little bit, um, Rick Varnell and, and Matt Davis, who helped helped set up the nonprofit um, and, and now are doing great things collectively to uh, really make the world a safer place as we become more connected across all aspects in our homes and our cars um, and our buildings. And that's really what the mission is of buildingcybersecurity.org. Now, when did you start BCS? So BCS was actually started while I was in government. I uh, I served uh, as a Secretary of Defense, and then the last eight months I was up at the White House. Um, so we started the idea um, as a collaboration between DOD and uh, other stakeholders. And while uh, I was in the White House, um, a, a really great select few of individuals decided, hey, we need to set up this nonprofit. So it was set up in 2020. Um, and then I took the helm in March of 2021. Now, you've talked about this before, and I know that you and I have talked about it, but why was it important to you for BCS to be a nonprofit? Yeah, I get um, I get chided by my board of directors every day um, because of that. Uh, you know, most folks are making a killing in the cyber technology space running for profits. And I, I guess maybe I don't know any better. I, I felt like a, a nonprofit is the way to go. But the real goal was to have competitors working side by side um, to come up with a, a set of standards, a framework that ultimately can serve all of society um, and, and really provide an incentive for wanting to make those investments to reduce cyber risk um, in our homes, in our cars, in our, in, our, uh, you know, in our buildings, in our schools. In order to do that, um, bringing people together quickly 
a, un, we really needed a nonprofit to be the objective standard. So our goal is to maintain ourselves a nonprofit and to be that global standard for which then other companies can see, hey, we, we, can, we support the BCS framework, we support the BCS certification process, but the process itself has to be able to grow as the cyber threat grows. And you really can't do that with a for-profit. You really need to have a independent objective look, bringing in a whole range of stakeholders who can say, for the sake of the industry, this needs to be the standard. So that's really why we formed as a nonprofit and will most likely continue as one. How long have you spent time in the cybersecurity space? So you talked about starting that uh, with the DOD and your time at the White House as an assistant uh, secretary of defense. Uh, d does your cybersecurity kind of knowledge and know-how extend before that? Or was this kind of something not recent, but something that has kind of been on the tail end of your career so far. Yeah, I, I, my my passion for wanting to make the world a safer place, you know, goes back way to my time, even before I started uh, diving into cybersecurity. Really, you know, what I think we're all put on this earth to try to make a difference. And what I found is there was a there was an aspect of what was happening in our society that was being under addressed or uh, or, or, or uh, under understood. Um, so really, uh, I'm not a, a cybersecurity technical expert. I don't have certifications. I don't have actual training. What I do have is a, a deep understanding of, of, of rallying experts around a, a cause and applying resources and actually getting something done. Um, I've seen too much, uh, particularly in the cybersecurity industry, a lot of people talking. Everyone's talking, here's the problem. Okay, here's what we got to do. Here, you know, it's a sensor problem, or it's this problem, or it's that problem. Here's what we got to do. No one's actually getting in and, and, and offering something to get it done. Um, so I, that's really where I think my strength is, not necessarily in having a deep, deep understanding. There are amazing experts out there who know OT sa uh, safety and security better than I do. Um, but what we've been able to do with NPCS is is galvanize and bring together a range of stakeholders through leadership, through thought thought, thought leadership, and saying, okay, here's what we plan to do, and get uh, an amazing group of experts who are the true experts rallying towards this common goal of creating a global framework that we're all going to be able to benefit from. So I would say it's more a leadership issue from my perspective, and not a deep technical expertise. No, and I think it's good too. And you know, you you realize that, and you're open about that, and you are now using your skill set and your giftings to the best of their ability to then organize those that again have that technical expertise. And if you go and look at bcs.org or uh, buildingcybersecurity.org and look at the people that are involved, very clearly, some of the best and brightest minds in the space are working on this issue. And that's one of the things that. Uh, really drew us to uh, KMC Controls to joining BCS and being a part of it and making sure that we too are keeping our thumbs on the pulse of you know everything that's happening in that space. Uh, I'm reading a book that was recommended to me called uh, "This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends," and I'm sure there's lots of lots of good books out there. Have you read that one in particular, Lucian? Yeah, Nicole did a good job with that. Um, you know, I, I I'm I'm a little bit. Uh, I think she did a fantastic job documenting the evolution of the threat. Um, the last, I think there's still more chapters to write. I think Nicole could probably do a volume two. Um, I think uh, we do need to concentrate on what needs to move forward with public policy. Um, but uh, she laid out very well uh, uh, how the th how the threat has evolved in a, in a very engaging way. So yes, I, I do also recommend the book. Well, and I think the thing that's really important about that is when we go and talk to customers and end users, so much of that is context that they don't inherently have, that they didn't, you know, they weren't around or they weren't paying attention uh, when those things were happening. And that's where I found it extremely helpful because it then does lay out, uh, you know, what the problem is today. What are some other resources that you would recommend to better understand the threat now and what we need to do in the future? Is there anything that you would say, podcast listener, go and buy this book? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of books out there that, uh, and I won't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to reference too many. I don't want, uh, because there's too many, I would, I would miss one and, and sure. end up um, making someone not too happy. Um, I, what I do, though, uh, every morning, I'm up early, I'm, I'm scouring the news. I, I do have about, you know, five catch words or, you know, that I just uh, Google or, you know, scan every day. Um, there's, there is a lot of information that comes out. Uh, daily on the evolution of the threat. I'm, I'm concerned about the current threats 
and where what can we do to address the things that are happening today. Unfortunately, you, you can't get that. You can get the history in a book, but you can't necessarily uh, see where our framework and BCS need to be going tomorrow. Mm. Um, and, and that's really what I'm focused on is making sure that we've got a credible framework that addresses the threat that exists today and what we see coming. Um, my time in that security agency when I was in DOD um, and, and up at the United States Cyber Command it made it clear to me that we are, it's a constantly evolving threat um, and, and that there are resources within CISA that I read every day. Um, their, their notices, I'm sorry, CISA for your reader, for your listeners, is the uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency under the, under the guise of the Department of Home Security. So I, I do more reading there mm. uh, to see what's coming out every day and where we as a nonprofit need to make sure our framework has that capability addressed um, and so we can stay relevant. So yes, that's really what I focus on day to day for reading. And that's good. And I don't think there are, maybe there are, again, uh, I'll, I'll uh, admit to ignorance in a lot of these things also. Is there a list of resources that we know we can go to? I, I love this idea of you know being active and present, looking for the real-time landscape um, where I have really appreciated the context that I'm gleaning from the, the book I had mentioned. Uh, that is one thing that I think I could personally improve on is making sure that I am staying as engaged and it's not even just current events, but... Uh, making sure I understand the landscape and all the data points that are coming at us real time and then forming opinions and, and thoughts based on that. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a, a underutilized resource that's nationwide. Um, and, and, they, and that is that I'm trying to remember the true and the information sharing networks. It's called ISACs. So every sector or critical infrastructure has an ISAC associated with it. And this really was intended to be the mechanism for which, um, federal agencies could take information about cyber threats and funnel it down to very specific uh, verticals, uh, 15 uh, uh, sectors of critical infrastructure, to be able to do that information sharing. Um, so uh, I think there, there does need to be a reinvigoration of that process. I know that's something that the team at CISA is looking at. How can we make that process more robust and more well-known? So folks like yourself who, who would love to know exactly what's happening in your industry um, can turn to something daily or once a week and check to see what's coming out. So I, I'm, I would put a big plug in for these nationwide ISACs, uh, but I also recognize that there's more that needs to be done so people understand that they're there um, and they're relevant and they can ultimately help you out um, in addressing cyber risk for your company. So Lucian, there is a huge network of people out there that are system integrators or uh, you know value-added resellers, engineering firms that are putting in the infrastructure in our buildings all the time. And one of the things that we hear a lot is you know either customers or end users don't seem to care much about cybersecurity. There is this, I think, underlying it's it's never going to happen to me mentality. How do we? I guess that's twofold. One, how do we educate? and empower the system integrators that are going out and deploying the infrastructure? And how do we educate in a way that doesn't seem like, uh, you know, fear-based marketing tactics? All right, Tim, there's a reason why you're a fantastic interviewer, and that's about the core. You've just hit the core two issues, I think, we that we are struggling with as a nation and even around the world. Um, so I had the same issue in Department of Defense. You know, I you know, within the first few months I was there, I, I had a brand new policy memo signed out by the Deputy Secretary of Defense and, and go do this, go mitigate OT cyber risk. And I did a happy dance and saying, hey, I, you know, I'm, I, I've got an order that says go invest in the things that I'm, that I'm concerned about. Um, and unfortunately, the mission owners, and I would equate them to the CEOs, looked at that and going, you know what, I've got other mission priorities I got to take care of. I'll get to that eventually, um, which, look, I can't fault them. I mean, and particularly in a, uh, the great country we live in, you know, it's all about, you know, what a CEO could do to generate revenue, to, you know, to enhance the brand, um, to meet shareholder or investor requirements. Um, and, and mitigating risk is not necessarily in our DNA. You know, we're out there taking on risk. You know, we're out there assuming risk. Um, and not only that, um, but when it comes to a, a, a remote risk like cybersecurity, what well, used to be remote, uh, we have a way to transfer that risk. You know, over to insurance. Like, I don't have to worry about it. I got an insurance company. Um, so that is what we've grown up with. And, and look, it, I, I, we understand that. So one of the things about building cybersecurity.org, which is different, is we, we made a conscious decision that we had to overcome 
that paradigm where a CIO, a chief information officer, is begging the CFO for dollars and just not getting them because it's just, you know, we're not in the risk mitigation business. So, um, so BCS believes, and we brought on, and one of our founding members is Aon, largest insurance broker in the world, and we wanted to tie um, our framework and, and certification into some type of benefit um, that could be received from insurance. This is not a new concept. When you and I buy a homeowner's policy, the first thing we do is we check that little block. Sometimes we may not check it honestly, but we check that block saying, hey, we have a home security system. Yeah, I've got a dog. All right, yes, I have a home security system. And you get a discount on your on your home insurance policy, right? And even now, uh, car insurers are offering those of us who, uh, don't, who don't care about our privacy to have a chip installed in our car and they can track our driving habits. And, and if it turns out we're a, a great driver, we get a discount on our car insurance. So, so there, there is a precedent for using um, or understanding client behavior um, or, or incentivizing client behavior in order to drive an outcome that reduces risk for an insurer. So we believe, and particularly as you see, uh, Tim, what you and I are involved with, which is a risk transferring from IT. Look, it's a nuisance for us to have our laptop hacked into or to lose financial data or to have a privacy concern. But when you see what a, a cyber attacker can do to OT, they can actually cause property damage. I, I'm sorry, I keep using terms OT, operational technologies, the things we surround ourselves with, the thermostats, the the uh, all the controls in a car, everything is OT. A smart TV is a series of operational technologies that are driven by a microchip. So, and all these smart technologies create a risk where a bad actor can ultimately cause property damage or worse, a threat to life, safety, health. So that now becomes a much more compelling case for an insurer that, okay, I definitely want to incentivize my clients to reduce the risk to life, safety, health. That's kind of how we're seeing this work out. That if you create a good framework solid that's embraced by the insurance company and the verticals um, that will offer a return, that CISO or the CIO can now say, hey, in exchange for the money we're going to spend, we're going to get this benefit. We'll, we can get, make it back over time. So that's really the incentive I think is going to work, uh, uh, particularly in the commercial side. Another thing, too, is you've got new federal regulations come on, coming into play. I think the uh, recent uh, proposed rulemaking by the Security and Exchange Commission for uh, you know publicly uh, traded companies to have to file uh, what cyber governance they have, what cyber programs they have. I think people are starting to wake up that, hey, look, this is a significant issue that we need to address because now it's being asked for in our filings. Our investors are starting to ask for it. Um, and I do believe it's going to continue to grow when as investors and shareholders start to understand how how much how devastating a cyber attack can have to the value of an asset, particularly in a physical environment, what I call the built environment. You know, how devastating a cyber attack can reduce value in a matter of hours. You know, whether it's an apartment building, a cyber attack to apartment or cyber building, uh, a cyber attack to a class A office building, how all of a sudden there's, there's a loss of tenant trust. There's, you know, an understanding, you know, the tenants actually business disruption in some cases. So we've, we've, we're starting to see a, a growing awareness. You're right. I don't want to scare people. I mean, I could give you stories that would you know, definitely keep me up at night for the last five years. Um, but, but I do believe we can offer a solution that says, okay, yes, if you invest in this, you should be compensated in some way by reducing your risk um, and by those who are mainly in the risk transfer business. You know, one of the things uh, I have a, a personal core tenant of mine, I was uh, properly educated in marketing and you learn all the different marketing techniques. And one of them that you learn about is fear-based marketing. And I never liked it. And I always told myself I was never going to be involved in fear-based marketing because I did not think fear is a proper motivator for anything. Um, but I do like, and that's another reason that we like joining BCS, is that there, it is an incentive-driven model um, around uh, cost reduction, risk reduction, risk reduction, but then also recognizing uh, that we can, as private organizations, help shape and guide what the federal regulation is to make sure that it matches with reality but then also is something that's actually feasible that we can do as, as individual companies. There's one other piece about BCS that I really like, and I learned uh, after I met with you after, uh, after we had joined, and that was the role of patriotism 
at least in terms of, of you, some of your motivation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I, I think uh, it, well, it's not just me. Um, it's unbelievable, Tim, um, the number of folks uh, who have given thousands of hours of their own time. We're talking about folks getting up at six and seven in the morning before they go to work and working on this framework. Um, and, and week after week, I mean, it is, it, and you ask them why, and because they feel like they're working on something that's, they can leave to their kids and grandkids, that, they, that, they, that that's actually truly, if implemented correctly, gonna make the world a safer place. Uh, and it, it, it's not a lot of times it's, you, you can come across something like that of giving yourself, giving your time, where there's truly a tangible outcome that's in mind, that, that's intended. And it's amazing how you can rally folks around that. So for me, I would say it's definitely a desire to want to leave something to my kids and grandkids, a safer world. I mean, look, they're going to be you know, surrounded by robots in 20 years from now. They're going to be immersed. They're going to be driving in an autonomous vehicle. You know, they're going to be uh, in buildings in their homes that we can't even imagine now. Um, we have to engineer those future technologies with safety, human safety in mind, particularly from cyber threats. So I, w I would say, yes, I mean, obviously, I've given my life to public service. I consider myself a patriot. Um, but I think it's also just the right thing to do. It, 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 if you want to get involved with something that truly will make a difference, I mean, not a lot of opportunities like that pop up in your lifetime. And, and the goal here is when you got it, when you got something where you can engineer safety into everything we're going to surround ourselves with in an increasingly digitized world, um, you got to latch on. And, and I'm, just, I'm just thrilled to have had so many other folks around us, to include you and, and, and the folks at KMC and others, say, hey, look, this is the right thing to do. You know, we should have thought of this 20 years ago. We've got to get in front of this. And so it's been, been an amazing journey. Well, and I, it's that same sort of mentality that I look at KMC being an American-owned, American-run company, we manufacture everything in the United States. You know, that's a core value that is that's just part of our organization. And it, it's really not even a matter of looking down at other companies that maybe don't prioritize U.S. manufacturing. I mean, you know, we we understand just as much as anyone the financial benefits of that. Um, but there is this sense of patriotism and driving towards, you know. The American dream, uh, you know, the freedom that we have and, and the way that we get to exercise that. And BCS is an organization that helps us maintain that and extend it for the next generation and the generation after that. Um, how did you get to be the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Infrastructure? Um, it was a, uh, you know, it, it, it's a great question. I get that all the time. It's like, you know, who did you know or, you know, what campaign did you work on? Um, I really didn't work on anybody's campaign. I didn't really come at it um, politically. Um, I had a a uh, reputation, uh, and when I was 11 years of doing oversight uh, on these particular programs for Department of Defense, I had a reputation of being really tough. Um, um, sometimes uh, tough to the point of people not liking what, how tough I was. Um, but I also had a, a reputation of being really competent and prepared. Um, I think what what I learned at a very young age is you've got to develop a brand. Not necessarily a reputation, but a brand of the thing that of of the character aspects that are associated with you, um, and you've got to and you've got to maintain that brand. You can't do anything to in any way distinguish that brand. Same thing a company goes through in brand protection. I think each of us have a brand of attributes, um, good and bad, um, that we embrace to say, okay, this is me. This is who I am, and this is where I, we can I can uh, contribute to society. Um, I think that is what resonated uh, as far as um, the reputation I had. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I, I was uh, I was filling of the assistant secretaries that the Secretary of Defense has. Um, my particular portfolio, which is real estate, energy, and environmental programs, wasn't the most sought out portfolio uh, for the, in Department of Defense. So uh, I also happened to, to get a little lucky that uh, I had some background and expertise um, in, in DOD, real property, energy, and environmental programs that Lend, lended itself very easily to the, the role I assumed in Department of Defense. So how long, you, you mentioned being in the Air Force, and I'm grateful for that, thank you. Uh, how long were you in the Air Force? So I did, uh, I had a, a, a ROTC scholarship. I could not have gone to the University of Notre Dame without it. Thank you, Air Force. So they, they graced me with a scholarship, and I graced them in return for uh, 16 years of active service, um, and then an additional uh, six in the Air National Guard in Virginia. Um, at the 16-year point, which is a very rough time to make a decision to leave the Air Force. 
that's when I was offered an opportunity to work in the United States Senate. Could not turn that down, so I ended up uh, transitioning and completing my and retiring as a mil in, the, in the Virginia Air National Guard. Yeah, fantastic. Now, what did you do in the Air Force? Were you a pilot? I yeah, for about six months. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah. l luckily, yeah. So luckily, the Air Force determined you know, after seeing me fly a a, a T thirty seven that eventually I was going to kill myself and maybe kill somebody else. Um, so they graciously <laughs> offered me an opportunity to go do something else in the Air Force, um, which I appreciate. At the time, obviously, everybody wants to be, you know, the next top gun. And, you know, I, of course, my ego thought I would be. But um, cooler heads prevailed. Um, and I was able to transition over to the civil engineering career field. Um, so uh, uh, there, they are units called prime, prime beef and red horse units um, in the Air Force. And we go around uh, repairing and building airfields. Um, so I'm an architect by degree, so I was able to work with engineers and craftsmen and, and uh, build buildings and build airfields all around the world. It was, it was a really a great opportunity uh, to, to lead and to learn um, and to uh, really grow as, you know, as, a, as an officer. And that's excellent. And then you learned a lot about infrastructure, obviously, and the needs of, of the space sure and the buildings. And sure did. Absolutely. Yes, along the way. Yep. So um, how does all of that then translate to your air traffic control uh, that, that you do on the side, you say? Well, if somebody saw me walking through the airport with these headphones on, like, hey, wait a minute, we've got some 1099 work from you. Can you go yeah. ahead and take the midnight <laughs> shift? So, but I get te I get te my, 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 uh, uh, my, uh, my son, you know, 20 year old son who's very tech savvy, teases me all the time that I'm wearing 1995 headphones. And I'm like, hey, they work and, and it's comfortable. So it's perfect. Good. All right. Well, at least you look the part. <laughs> um, <laughs> You, you you talked about building a brand and having a reputation. Um, toughness was that something that came natural? Do you think that was ego driven, or was that part of the brand that you were trying to develop? Oh come on now! Uh, I, yeah, I'm an I'm an architect from Philadelphia, and I you know went to Notre Dame. That's like three pillars of arrogance in their respective fields. So I think I, I think I definitely I think it definitely was a um, an understanding. I mean, I have a. I have a motto I live by uh, that I loved even when I was a kid um, by a, an amazing guy, George Bernard Shaw, uh, who says, you know, that the uh, the reasonable man persists in adapting himself to the world. The unreasonable man persists in adapting the world to himself. Therefore, all progress lies with the unreasonable man. Um, so so you, you got it. You've got to spend your life if you're comfortable with it, um, you know, pushing the limits, uh, looking for new ideas or, or at least asking the hard questions and challenging. Um, so challenging, particularly working for a senator like John McCain, who himself was a natural challenger. Um, challenging came natural for me um, and is exactly what uh, oversight's all about uh, when you're serving in the Senate. So, yes, it, it, I seem to have found um, opportunities for me that, that allowed me to, to feel natural about asking the hard questions for, for, for I, what I hoped was the benefit of the country. You said that you worked for John McCain. How long was that? So uh, he inherited me. I actually started working for uh, Senator John Warner out of Virginia um, in 2003, and uh, Senator McCain reluctantly inherited me despite being a Notre Dame grad um, um, in 2008. And so I worked uh, for him up until I think 2012 or 13, when you know he was no longer a ranking member of the committee. And I also worked for another great Senator, Jim Inhofe from Oklahoma, for, for one year before I left the Senate in 2014. Did you enjoy working for McCain? I, I loved working for all the senators. Uh, I do believe, particularly in the Senate Armed Services Committee, it's an incredible opportunity to contribute every day. You hear about partisan politics in D.C., and definitely there, it's, there's a lot of polarization right now. But when you get on a committee uh, that's dedicated to the nation's defense, a lot of that partisanship slips away. And uh, we are committed as a professional staff, and there's only a small group of us. People don't realize there's only about, you know, about – between depends on whether you minority majority at one point we were down to six but up to 15 or 20 professional staff members that are there to support the senators and making some pretty important decisions for our country so it was an honor i loved working for senator mccain and uh, he's he was obviously a little bit more um abrupt or, or direct than senator warner was also love working for senator warner uh, amazing amazing human being um, and and Senator Inhofe. So each has their strengths. Each has their commitment to our country. So it was a, it was a joy to work for all three. Do you ever miss the Hill? Um, uh, not lately. <laughs> 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 There's been a lot of uh, issues. Uh, so so we had to get a uh, we uh, we were part of the we were the committee that got the National Defense Authorization Bill done every year, um, and we actually got it into law every year. And that takes a lot of effort. 
Um, and there were a lot of all-nighters, a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, effort to, to make sure we were answering the hard questions. When you have to stand in front of 23, 24 senators and ask your questions on policy, you have to do your all your prep work. Um, so I loved it. Um, it. I would highly recommend anybody that wants to make a difference. Um, uh, but I've obviously looking at new new ways to to you know contribute to the national dialogue and uh, and you know, and make a difference. Well, it, it sounds like you're using a lot of that work ethic, a lot of that knowledge and experience, and uh, again that that personal brand that you have uh, to to continue that effort in this nonprofit, uh, which is again just very exciting to be a part of and and to work with you on. Um, do you think is it, it is an overstatement that we should have more of a wartime mentality when we think about cybersecurity in our buildings and infrastructure? So I try to avoid um, hyperbole and rhetoric. Uh, I would say we much we must have a much more deliberate understanding of risk. Um, we manage risks, uh, Tim, in our entire lives. You know how much how much do we put on our car insurance policy? You know, do we check that box so that we have a home security system, even though we don't have it on? You know, we, we, we take risk every day with our lives. I, I, I don't believe um, that we are spending much time, much, as much of a time as a nation um, talking about cyber risk. Uh, there is a lot of attention looking at risk factors, uh, particularly environmental risk factors and other resilience risk factors. Um, and ultimately, what, what can affect us as a society? Um, and I understand all that, you know, but I, but when I was in the Department of Defense, I managed all uh, real property, energy and environmental programs. Um, so everything from climate change to, you know, uh, greenhouse grass reductions to how we spend money on energy programs. And I got to tell you, cyber was was number one for me. Um, it is it is an existential risk. Um, in a matter of hours, our lives can be changed, not decades, you know, not you know, in five years or 10 years or 100 years, like in a matter of hours, our lives can be fundamentally changed um, and not necessarily in a good way. So, yes, I, um, I do. I don't think we need a wartime posture. What I think we need to do is recognize of all the things we're trying to do with as a society. And a lot of them are good. And, and, and I don't want to stop progress. I'm not saying, hey, we should stop being a smarter society, a more intelligent society. Um, uh, technology will bring good to us uh, across all sectors and, and across all society. Definitely want that to happen. We just have to be aware and we have to be deliberate about engineering safety and security and everything we're doing in the future. And for me, it is as important as anything else out there in my particular, because I think it's actually more important. Um, the most important thing. That's really why I take in my life to it. Um, so I would not say a wartime posture. I would just say that we have to have a better understanding of the risk that we are accepting and ultimately what can be done to reduce it. Yeah. I think there's, you know, this kind of, uh, we don't want to be caught on our back foot, right? You know, we want to be uh, ready or at least uh, in the know. And it's, it's. Yeah. One thing to add there is, you know, as a nation, I've seen in my professional career, again, in public service, I've seen us um, as a nation, uh, lead by crisis and not necessarily lead by uh, by forward thinking. Um, it's a lot easier to pass legislation when we've already had an attack. You know, solar winds and uh, you know, and the Colonial Pipeline attack both result in, in executive orders um, and efforts. Um, I hate for that to happen. I would I, I don't want to see another attack on operational technologies potentially cause a loss of life. Um, so yes, I do get frustrated that we in this nation respond to crisis more than we respond to a deliberate deliberate critical look at an emerging threat and saying hey let's get in front of it so yes i do want to uh, not sorry take a wartime footing but to make sure that we can get in front of this best we can without waiting for something catastrophic to happen i agree and and uh you know again that's one of the reasons we're so excited to be part uh, and to partner with you in bcs who are some of the people early on in your career that you think best prepared you and, and, you know, came alongside you and, and now has kind of helped propel you into where you are today? Oh, gosh. Um, I think if you look at it, our lives, we all have, and I call them angels. Um, there, are, there are folks who you, you never anticipated but stepped in just at the right moment. I mean, I can go back uh, to the days I showed up at the University of Notre Dame with no money and no way to stay at the university and, you know, was turned down by, you know, for service scholarships. Uh, but one captain and, you know, Ken Fisher, I'll never forget his name, 
saw something in me and he says, let me see what we can do. And, and, uh, and three weeks later, he said, I found a way to get you a scholarship. Um, and look, I never met him before that three weeks. And uh, like I said, there are angels that come your way every step and kind of guide you. I've, I've never been a plan guy. You know, you, you always you know, see some folks who they've got a five year, 10 year, 20 year plan. I've always taken the Zen approach where, you know, or the Tao approach. I'm, you know, I'm flowing water, moving around obstacles and looking for opportunities. Um, and it's incredible. You look at folks who have just stepped in to just put you in a certain direction that end up um, being in an amazing, amazing opportunity. And I could look to a lot of military leaders. Again, I don't want to name every one of them uh, because I don't want to forget one. But there were there were uh, there were general officers and folks who talk, pulled me aside and saying, hey, you're a little little caustic, a little rough around the edges, but um, keep doing what you're doing uh, because you're actually making everybody better, making everybody think. And, and there are those leaders who realize that, that having somebody come in as a disruptor, and remember, disruption is always, is, has only recently been a term that's been a positively accepted in, in, you know, in, in business. Um, uh, I, I think I was labeled as a disruptor way back when, when I was a second lieutenant. And there were, um, there were thought, uh, thought, thoughtful leaders who saw that, hey, yes, he was disrupting, but ultimately he was making the unit better. Um, so, uh, so I've had a, a few of those along the way. Um, that have not only um, cleared the way, but promoted me and saying, hey, he's he's definitely knows what he's talking about. Uh, and I, I just I appreciate that. I I've learned from every one of them. Um, I think obviously having uh, mentors, the senators that I work for, you know, remind me that, hey, I didn't get elected. They did um, to kind of wrote, rain, rain me in a little bit um, uh, has always been a very positive influence on me. And yes, so I, I would say it's pretty much just about every boss from Secretary Jim Mattis to Senator John McCain, you know Senator John Warner, you know, Jim Inhofe, all the way down to uh, you know my uh, the leaders I had in the Air Force. Um, I've been blessed with a, a a series of of mentors that have that have um, a, allowed some of the positive things attributes of me uh, to to be able to grow and have an impact. So I can't name one. I mean, there's so many um, that are either angels or mentors. Um, but you, but the lessons they've taught me is. Um, stick to your guns, uh, do what you think is right, um, and, and then also be open to the whisper. I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in being surrounded by those you trust who are what I call whispers that basically whisper in your, hey, you're screwing up or, or, or here's the downside. Um, and you got to embrace those. I think that's a big business philosophy. You cannot have a leadership team that's built upon folks who support you. You've also got to have folks who are willing to speak up and say, hey, that's the wrong course. And here's why. And, and, and have the courage to do so. And you need to enable that. Um, I think one of the things that I learned very, from my mentors is um, when you're in any organization, you ultimately have to work for them. I, I know it sounds good on paper, uh, but it's what you have to do that as a leader, particularly in government. You have to walk in. Here are my goals. And then my, have my senior staff tell me how we're going to achieve those goals. And then turn around and say, OK, how can I work for you to clear your way? So you, so you, so now you're as a leader, you're clearing the obstacles that at your level you can to allow the folks underneath you to be successful. That is a very, very powerful concept that I learned from my mentors. That you ultimately have to um, work for the folks that that are working for you in order to make them successful. Once they taste that success, um, then the sky's the limit. They're gonna, then they're gonna just power through. Um, and all you got to do at that point is hang on. It's like the chariot. Once you get the horses going, you just you know you're just guiding for dear life, and you and you're clearing the obstacles in front of them along the way. Um, so I learned that from a series of mentors, um, and it's something that if we could, Tim, you and I could leave something for next season um, about leadership, about uh, propelling a company. It would start with how do you get to a point where it's not just an idea, but it's put into action where your team down the down to them to the admin knows that you're doing nothing but clearing obstacles for them to be successful. Um, and I think that's what a boss really should do. Have that strategic vision, but then go to work making their team successful. So Lucian, you've had mentors. Do you feel like you've been mentors to other people that you've been able to pass some of those things on? Yeah, I hope. I mean, I, I do spend a lot of time on the on phone calls with folks who would just like to pick my brain. Um, it's more of an informal process. I, I do, I think, have that brand that I'm accessible. Um, and I'm willing to give an opinion. I think that's probably folks know that for me for, for decades. I am the first person that's willing to give an opinion. Um, and, uh, and, but for the most part, those opinions are valid, and, or at least they've got some, some gems of, of truth to them. 
Um, so I, I do do a lot of uh, informal mentoring um, and, and also, uh, uh, you know, spending time just, you know, trying to give folks career guidance and whether it be uh, young military officers or whether it be folks in the cyber industry or even college. I've been talking to a lot of college classes lately about, you know, what what is the future look like and how you can you know, make a difference. So um, I find every opportunity to try to get back. Why such a strong passion for making the world a safer place, being put on this earth to make it better and to give back to others? Where does that come from? I don't know. Come, I mean, I guess we all have things where uh, the good Lord has imparted into us as, as strengths in our soul. Um, and you just got to recognize them you know, and to become natural for you. Look, one of, the, one of the things I tell, you know, a lot of folks who are getting ready to transition to the military, you got to find your passion. Yeah, you, you don't want to go look for a job. What is your passion? What is it that you would get up at six in the morning and work until midnight on? You know what? It, and and you have to find that. Once you do, you're gonna have a happy life because you are working on something you want to work on. So I, I think it's it's a matter of finding something that uh, that you know you can make a difference. The idea that we came up with in BCS about a certification process. I can't tell you how many folks that have been working on cybersecurity for 20 years and like, holy crap, why did we think of that? I mean, so sometimes it just happens to be a moment of clarity, um, and then and then you build upon that. So the, the the underlying goal is to find something that comes natural to you that you just feel like, yeah, everything in my being was intended towards this purpose, um, and then let and then let it run from there. Well, Lucian, I think your approach to cybersecurity, your passion for it, for making things better, for making people safer, uh, you know, just like the the attitude behind it and the the strength i think that's probably the best way to attack this problem like like i said earlier it's not fear it's not um you know it, it, it's it's not driven by kind of the self-serving nature of the the it vendor market uh but it's you know this non uh, this non-profit spirit and because of that and because of your just this drive. I'm trying to think of like the word that really fits and I can't I can't quite, you know, think of it, but it's just you set an example and you inspire to approach it in a certain way. And that's what I really appreciate. And that's why I think that you are a building genius and it's absolutely right that we take such a serious topic that is very much a present problem and a future problem and kind of capstone our podcast season on that and, and hopefully inspire and encourage others to take a similar approach in their career. But as we, as we address this problem. So thank you. Yeah, Tim, Tim, your um, I mean, your podcast, I think is great. I'm not sure. Um, I don't think anybody's ever called me a genius before. I think there's a lot of folks who are going to actually probably wince at that because that's just more arrogance. Hey, I've been called a genius, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but I do, I do believe that uh, some of the focus that you're bringing uh, together on the podcast of those who are looking to make um, the built environment, and, that, and that's kind of what I think it, it's not just buildings, it's infrastructure, it's everything. The built environment, a better. it could be your smart TV, um, uh, because as you know, there are the same set of controls. I think what you're doing by bringing together thought leaders uh, who are at, addressing this problem from different angles is absolutely uh, uh, essential. I think there does need to be uh, a second season. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, to see who else you can bring on. Um, but the goal is to drive the discussion forward. And look, I welcome, if people don't think we're on the right track, we, as you know, we went through a series of critiques of our framework where we asked folks to get on a call and, and beat us up and you know, tell us how bad we are. Um, so I think you've, we've got to we've got to take those types of steps uh, to ensure that what we put forth for society is credible, um, will have an effect, and will meet its our intended goal, which is uh, safety in engineering, safety in design, safety and commissioning and safety in the operations of a building. Again, we have a performance framework. It's going to be consistent, not just a checklist, but you have to maintain it over over every day. Um, that's really what we need to address the cyber threat. Well, let's do it. We're partners with you. I'm excited about the future. I'm ready to see that start to roll out and become scalable and to help you do that. So thanks for your time today, Lucian, and, and best of luck. We'll talk again very soon, I know. Yeah, I appreciate it, Tim. I'm excited for a second season. I'm hoping we... I mean, it's not quite somebody getting shot in the very last scene, but uh, but yeah, looking forward to uh, to see what you uh, come up with. Hopefully, we you know, folks will maintain their interest, um, and you can have a second season of exciting and uh, um, inspiring thought leaders. I think you have a you, you, the way you interview is fantastic. So, I'm really hoping uh, to hear more of you, more of your podcast. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, well, that wraps this episode and this season 
of the Building Geniuses podcast or production of KMC Controls. If you've enjoyed this conversation, we encourage you to subscribe and share. And if there's anyone that you'd like to see on this podcast next season, or hopefully maybe even season three, tag them in the comments below and or reach out to us and we'll tag them in the comments. And as always, we appreciate you listening. Until next time, learn something new, teach someone something, and build your inner genius. <laughs>